It's great to see you. And I mean it. Isn't it amazing that we can see each other and that we can see the world around us? Our sense of vision is crucial to almost every aspect of our daily life, be it helping us grab a cup of coffee in the morning, finding our way to work, or simply admiring the beauty of the world around us. And it's not just us. Many animals use vision as their primary sense. And because of the tremendous importance of vision to human and animal life, I've long been fascinated by this sense. And I'm particularly intrigued to understand how neural processing in the brain shapes the visual experience. Today, I'm going to take you to the absolute limits of vision, to the night. Consider this. We depend on a sense that in turn depends on the availability of light. And it's challenged every day by the setting of the sun and the fading of the light. I will show you how neural processing in the brain can push the boundaries of the visual sense to lower light intensities. And the animal I've conducted my work in is this beautiful hawk moth, the elephant hawk moth, Dalephila elpenor. It serves as a model to illustrate how to bring light to the dark using neural adaptations in the brain. But before we dive into the story, I think we have to address the elephant hawk moth in the room. I said I'm interested in how neuroprocessing in the brain shapes the visual experience, and now I'm telling you I'm working on an insect. And face it, insects are not really famous for the size of their brains. Indeed, if you would call my hawk moth pea-brained, she would love you forever. She'd wish she was, because her brain is actually a lot smaller than the size of a pea. But it is this tiny size of their brains that makes my work possible because it allows me to dissect the contributions of individual neurons in this visual processing. But I don't want you to think that I'm using hawk moths as an imperfect or reduced model of our superior visual sense. They can achieve impressive feats with their tiny brains. They can actually see really well at night. And I chose this particular hawk moth because it was the first species, the first animal species, that has ever been shown to have trichromatic color vision at night. That's the kind of color vision we humans have, and the moths can use it to still find the favorite flowers by their color, even under starlight conditions. If you'd ask me, or if I'd ask you to do that, you'd horribly fail, because we humans only see the world as a shade of grays under starlight. But what do the moths use their impressive visual abilities for? Well, they use them to go about their business, and that's zooming around on the lookout for flowers that they can feed from. And when they find a flower, they hover in front of it to suck a nectar, just like a hummingbird. And in my work, I wanted to understand how these hawk moths can see so well at night and how their brains help them to achieve this. Now, before we get there, we first have to understand why is it actually so hard to see at night? And it all starts with light. In order to see something, light particles, or photons, have to arrive at the eye, and they're picked up by neurons called photoreceptors. These photoreceptors detect the photons and send information about the light to the brain. In the brain, the information is further processed, and an image of the outer world can be reconstructed. Now, the problem with vision at night is the low abundancy of photons, the fuel of vision. There can be up to 10 million times fewer photons during a starry night than a sunny day. If you want to imagine what that means, imagine photons are raindrops. And during the night, you experience a light drizzle of rain, whereas during the day, you're standing right under the Niagara Falls. But there is a second problem with vision at night, and that's the uncertainty of photon arrival. Photons, just like raindrops, arrive in a stochastic manner. That means at any given point in time, you don't know how many raindrops or photons will arrive. So if you were to count raindrops in this orange area, every second, let's say, you would be counting three raindrops, five, six, four. Well, you would be counting different numbers at any sample point. And this spread represents the unreliability or the stochasticity in raindrop or photon arrival. Now, if you're taking your shower under the Niagara Falls and you're still counting raindrops, then you would count a much higher number of raindrops at any given sample time. That means your average number of raindrops is higher, but it also means that the uncertainty is lower, the unreliability is decreased when you have a higher average number of raindrops or photons. 
So if we bring that back to the visual system, during the day, we have a high number of photons, and they arrive with a low uncertainty, so that the brain can reconstruct reliable images of the world. Whereas at night, there are only a few photons arriving at the eye with a high uncertainty, which makes it hard for the visual system to reconstruct reliable images. And if there are too few photons and their arrival is too uncertain, well, then vision cannot produce a reliable information about the world anymore, and it becomes useless. So to summarize, vision at night is challenged by the low availability of photons and the high uncertainty associated with their arrival at the eye. But how can visual systems overcome these challenges? Well, if there are not many photons available um, for the visual system, it needs to collect more. And how can you collect more photons? Photographers have figured this one out. You need better optics. Larger lenses and larger apertures collect a larger fraction of the available light. And animals are doing just the same. My elephant hawk moths has really gigantic eyes that collect a lot of light. It actually has about 12,000 individual facets in each eye to collect as many of the available photons as possible. Now, the interesting thing with these hawk moths is, though, that um, when looking carefully at the anatomy of their eyes, um, it has been shown that these eyes should actually just be able to see up to about dim moonlight intensities. But the hawk moths can still detect colors at starlight. How is that possible? And it's not just moths. We have actually also found this difference in sensitivity between the eyes and the brain in cockroaches and nocturnal sweat bees. So how do we explain this gap in performance between the eyes that stop responding somewhere at dim moonlight and the animal's behavior that can still see at starlight? Well, that's the hypothesis going into my work, and it is that this gap is bridged by neural adaptations in the brain that enhance the sensitivity of the hawk moths. And you can imagine these neural adaptations to be like digital processing of the images that you've taken with your fancy optics. And in pulse processing, you can change the brightness or the contrast of the images. So taken together, visual systems can overcome the challenges of vision at night by catching more photons with their specially equipped eyes or, and that's my hypothesis going into this work, with neural adaptations that further improve the sensitivity. So that brings me to the first question in my work. Can I find any evidence for these neural adaptations in the brain of hawk moths? And here you see a 3D reconstruction of a brain of a hawk moth. And the question is, where am I going to look for these neural adaptations? What you see on the sides are these two big yellow-red blobs. We call them the optic lobes. They're right under the eyes of the hawk moths, and they process visual information. So they're a good place to start looking. And within these optic lobes, there's a red structure that we call the lobular plate. We know that neurons in this lobular plate help insects to control their flight. So if the hawk moths are still flying around under starlight conditions, Neurons in this lobular plate must be sensitive enough to support this behavior. And they're likely sensitive enough because they're benefiting from neural adaptations. So I targeted these neurons in the lobular plate, and they're called lobular plate tangential cells. But for the rest of this talk, we can just call them flight control neurons or flight neurons. And what I did was to insert tiny glass microelectrodes into these neurons so I could pick up their activity. And their activity would tell me about how they're processing visual information. And so I did these recordings while the moth was looking at a computer screen and looking at a very boring TV program. This consisted simply of black and white stripes that were moving. And this movement was meant to simulate the movement a moth would see as it's flying through the world and the environment is moving by its eyes. Just a very simplified version of that. I could also dim my computer screen to step through all the different light intensities down to starlight levels. And very importantly, I also did all of these recordings in the photoreceptors in the eye. Because I told you before, there are two ways to improve visual sensitivity. One is by adaptations in the eye, and one is by neural adaptations in the brain, or so we hypothesize. Now, I need to be able to separate these two contributions. And by recording the photoreceptors in the eye, I can tell the contribution of the eye. And by recording the flight neurons, I can tell what contributions there are in the brain. So let's get into it. What did I find? 
Here you see the responses of the flight neurons to a range of light intensities. You see their sensitivity responding to these black and white stripes. We start at sunset intensities and we go down to starlight intensities. And what you see is that from sunset intensities up to about dim moonlight, the flight neurons were very sensitive. And then their sensitivity slowly dropped down to starlight intensities, which is not surprising because there are fewer and fewer photons available and it's getting harder and harder for the visual system. The important bit is to see that there were still reliable responses, even though they were weak, at starlight intensities. And that is um, the physiological basis for the behavior we saw in the animals. Now we have a neuron that is still responding and could explain to us why these animals can still see and fly around. Now, the interesting comparison comes when we see what the eye is doing. And in green, you see the sensitivity of the eye in all of these light intensities. And you see that already starting at moonlight intensities, the eye is a lot less sensitive than the neurons in the brain. And very importantly, if we look at starlight intensities, the eye is not giving us any reliable responses anymore. But the neurons in the brain are which is telling us they must get additional sensitivity and they must be getting it from neural adaptations. They can't be getting it from the eye because the eye is not responding reliably anymore. And actually, the difference between the sensitivity of the flight neurons and the sensitivity of the eye is about a hundredfold. So the brain is about a hundred times more sensitive than the eye in this hawk moth. So to summarize, I did find evidence for neural adaptations in the brain of hawk moths and in the responses of these flight neurons that are 100 times more sensitive than the photoreceptors in the eye. And that brings us to the next question. How is this possible? What neural adaptations are actually improving the sensitivity? And I will walk you through my hypothesis for what is happening in the brain before I show you the data so that you know what to look for. And that brings us back to the raindrops. Remember I told you one problem with vision at night is the high uncertainty in the arrival of photons that we can also see in the spread in our raindrop count. Now, if we were to count raindrops in a larger area, we would be counting more raindrops because we are summing more raindrops over this larger area. So we get a higher average count, and I told you before, a higher average count is associated with a smaller uncertainty. So by summing raindrops in space, we're boosting our signal, we're counting more raindrops, and we're decreasing the uncertainty. And we can achieve the same thing by going back to a small area, but integrating over longer time steps. So that at every integration time, we're counting more raindrops because the integration times are longer. That means a higher average count and a reduced um, uncertainty. So using this spatial and temporal summation, we can actually improve the sensitivity of a very unsensitive and unreliable visual input. Just like you can do in a camera, you can increase the shutter time of the camera and collect more photons um, when taking your picture. Or you can make bigger pixels and thus collect more photons per pixel. But you see that that also brings with it a catch. And that is that if we have longer shutter times or larger pixels, we're actually losing resolution. So if we open the shutter time of a camera or we're doing temporal integration, then if we have a fast-moving object like a car, it will just be represented as a blur in the picture because we don't have enough sample points to actually capture the movement. And similarly, if we have large pixels, we're losing the fine spatial detail. So performing spatial and temporal summation means that we're losing spatial and temporal resolution. And that's actually great for me as a neuroscientist because that gives me something to look for in the responses of the neurons. So the loss of spatial and temporal resolution is a signature I can look for to know that there's spatial and temporal summation in the brain. So to summarize, what I hypothesize is happening in the brain of the hawk moths is spatial and temporal summation that improves sensitivity, and I will be looking for a reduction in spatial and temporal resolution in the responses of the neurons to see if they're actually performing this summation. So let's get to it. What did I actually find? In order to um, see if the neuron's um, spatial and temporal resolution changes, I'm recording from the same flight neurons, and now I'm showing them still black and white moving bars, and to test their spatial resolution, I'm showing them coarse bars and fine bars to see the whole range of their spatial acuity. And similarly, in the temporal domain, I'm showing them very slow bars, and very fast-moving bars to test the temporal range. 
And you will see the responses of these neurons coming up here, and you will see on the x-axis the spatial responses, and on the y-axis the temporal responses, axis is left side are the coarse responses, right side the fine responses, on the bottom the slow, and on the top the fast responses. And now here is an example of a response of such a flight neuron to all these different spatial and temporal patterns. And I just want you to focus on the part where the neuron is responding the strongest, and that is this dark red part in the center. We will now step through the light intensities from sunset to starlight, and I will indicate the spatial patterns the neurons are responding to, and you can see that indicated here by the white stripe. So as we're stepping from sunset down to moonlight intensities, and to starlight, you can watch how the neurons' responses change with respect to these spatial patterns. And what you see is that as we go to lower and lower light intensities, the neurons are responding to coarser and coarser stimuli. That means their spatial resolution is decreasing. We can look at the similar um, responses, but for the temporal acuity, again indicated by the white stripe here, and we start at sunset intensities, we go down to moonlight, and to starlight, and we'll show it to you again. You will see that as we go lower and lower in light intensities, also the neurons are responding to slower and slower patterns. That means their temporal resolution is decreasing. So in the responses of the neurons, we see that as we go to lower and lower light intensities, their spatial and temporal resolution decreases. And that's exactly what we expected to see. That's our signature to find that there is spatial and temporal summation in their brain. So we can conclude from, these, um, from this data that hot moths indeed perform spatial and temporal summation in their brain and that it helps them to improve their sensitivity by about a hundred times compared to what their eyes do. Now, if you think about this for a moment, this is actually a pretty simple trick. The hawk moth can see a hundred times better than it would be with its eyes alone, just by summing information in space and time. And this simple and effective algorithm is actually indicative of the insect brain in general. I said in the beginning, insect brains are tiny. They only have about, and then they're lucky, a million neurons. Whereas we have about 86 billion. That's the size of San Francisco versus 10 times the world population. Yet insects find food, they court mates, they find and avoid predators, and they move through the world just like we do. But they have a lot less neural capacity to do this. And that means they have to find simple and effective solutions to do it. And that makes insects and their brains very attractive to everyone who wants to develop technological solutions that also can't have a lot of um, processing capacity, such as autonomously moving cars or drones that can't carry gigantic supercomputers with them. And insect brains can be a blueprint for algorithms controlling such technical devices. One example um, that has been inspired by the spatial and temporal summation I found in the hot moth brain is um, processing software for camera images that helps to improve their sensitivity. And I will show you how they work. On the left side here, you will see a raw camera image of a camera moving through a little scenery. And on the right side, you will see the same image, but post-processed with this software that includes spatial and temporal summation. And if you watch the camera feed, you will see that actually this post-processing has been able to regain a lot more structures from the image and actually improve greatly the sensitivity of the scene, just as spatial and temporal summation do in the hawk moth brain. Seeing well at night is just one of the many things insects can achieve with their tiny brains. Others can migrate over thousands of kilometers, memorize the colors and positions of their favorite flowers, or strike precisely using stereo vision. So next time you see one of our pea braid friends, take a minute to marvel at these fantastic behaviors that their tiny brains control. Think about all these neural strategies that are still there to be discovered just like the spatial and temporal summation that the hawk moths use to bring light to the dark.